That's a one way to open an episode. <laughs> Welcome to the Flick Lab. Oh, I'm Karri. Against all odds we have actually a guest from Chad. He was born in near Uganda border. So, Abdul Baba, welcome to the show. Hello. Hi, nice to have you here. Oh, thank you. Can you hear us? It's clear. Perfect. Okay, now finally something should be working here. God damn this technology and uh, guests, of course, everything goes to hell at that point. Na- naturally, that's been the running theme of the whole fucking show. <laughs> <clears throat> the wondrous adventures in the audio quality. Yeah. So, Henrik, you are my co-host. Ain't that right? Unfortunately, yeah. At least still for the moment. <laughs> what did I, I I'm, do? I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to be kicked off from the podcast. At some point, after you have a second, relatively sick of all the shit I try to pull here. The shit that you pull here? I thought you were accusing me of my shit that I pull here. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that that was in the past episode, like the latest we did. Now it's, what was again, a fresh table and fresh accusations. So, Henrik, my dear co-host, my dear Finnish Bedouin, have you ever tasted camel? <laughs> o- only the cigarette brand. Oh. Uh, in the capital, you find the Fukami, but I do not recommend Henrik, you, your fin Finland. Yep. Born and raised. Where is Santa Claus? Where is Santa Claus? Precisely, I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, actually, I, I, I'm in the city of Santa Claus currently. Is he burning in the sun? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, at this point, yeah. Unfortunately, we are losing the winter completely in Lapland. Oh, come to chat, my friend. Every day, grilling day. <laughs> I actually, you know, might be interested in visiting Chad at some point. Once, uh, w- once I'm not so goddamn broke. Uh, did you like this film? I gave it one star. <laughs> I, I, I did enjoy this film quite a lot. I, th- I, and I thought that it did have an interesting perspective to civil war in general. Okay. Well, shit. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that that that's the first. <laughs> like, sorry, Kari, I I I think I I I lost us the quest here. Henrik, yeah. Yeah, um, if you, yeah, if you, th- th- this this yeah. was uh, this is on me. I, I fully <laughs> admit this, this is on me. <laughs> Just a little double whammy, Henrik. I, I don't know if you noticed, but I was this African guy just now. It's my time to pull your leg. <laughs> god oh my god! It. I can't believe I went through that trouble. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. That, that was a good one. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, was, I, I, I was actually so, you know, relieved that you somehow managed to find a guest <laughs> for the episode. And this, w- this wouldn't be just on us, you know, to cover a Chadian film. I, I, I completely fell for that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, f- <clears throat> now, welcome to the Flick Club. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah um. we are we are a serious film podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little past the April first date, but uh. well, well, a good good stunt is always a good stunt. <laughs> yeah, it's about two guys right here, right now from Finland who analyze one movie for every week from any given genre, and one of us has a diploma in media and kind of enjoys you know complaining about all the technical aspects and the other one is going to be a master of arts 
Sounds like we know what we're doing. A- at least on the, you know, official level. Like, we, we have the mandate and the diplomas. Yeah. So, so everything that you are going to hear on this episode is, is cutting-edge film criticism. <laughs> oh my god. <clears throat> so this, is, uh, this film is part of the podcast's International Cinema Challenge for 2019. This means we will watch 20 delicately selected films for your viewing pleasure. And watch them throughout the year. So the persons who join us and watch all the 20 films wins the prize of having a feeling of um, achievement. And Have, having pa- a feeling, feeling of spending countless of hours on a completely irrelevant task. But hey, free pat on the back is waiting for them. If we ever meet you, dear listener. Yeah, we, we can give you, you know, an audio pat on the back at the end of the international cinema run. Yeah. But uh, also, you are free to visit the podcast if you do watch all of them as your guest and talk about the experience of watching these excruciating films. And that's going to happen around the end of the year or like January 2020, most probably. But you can also watch 20 films from different countries and they don't have to be exactly these films that we picked right here. So what's your experience uh, with a screaming man, Henrik? You can be no, creative here. No experience at all. Not with well, not with most of the people behind the scenes either. The actors I most recognized were uh, Diu Koma, who played Abdel, and Emil Abosolo Ambo, who was the territorial chief in the film. Other than that, the director, unfortunately for me. Unfamiliar, and also everybody else on the cast. Yeah. Any other experiences with screaming men? Any of those in Northern Finland? No, because we hide our feelings and don't express them. Ah. And neither does this bastard, actually. I mean, the film's name is a screaming man, and the dude doesn't scream once. He screams inside, Henrik. It's poetic and smart. It's it's very artsy. I must give it give it that. That it is. Well, Henrik, we have probably noticed that this film takes place in Chad, so let's have a chat about Chad, if we well, will. Yeah, let's talk all about Chad at this point. Yep. A country which unfortunately today shares a name with a goddamn internet meme. <laughs> um. <laughs> I was in Reddit trying to find information about Chad, but I just found some channels that I could just not understand what they were about, but it was not definitely not about the country Chad. Yeah, well, there, there, there is the divination between Chad countries and Virgin countries. <laughs> I, I guess those were the statistics that you actually run across in Reddit. <laughs> yeah, could be. Well, Chad, it's a landlocked African country bordering Nigeria, Niger, Libya, Sudan, Central African Republic, and Cameroon. It's not quite yet at the equator, but uh, pretty much in the heart of Africa, but it's sometimes called the dead heart of Africa, due to its distance from the sea and being mostly a desert, Henrik. And there are official languages, French and Arabic, 80% speak the Chadian dialect of Arabic. It's kind of the lingua franca. So the primary language to use. Over 100 indigenous languages are also spoken. Interestingly, 55% Islam and 40% Christianity. And um, the conflicts in and around Chad do not seem to have primarily anything to do with the religion. So is Chad actually a good example of a religious coexistence or who knows? Uh, Who knows? I mean, it is still a country which has a chronological history with civil wars. And even though they are not, at least on a large part, a part tied into the religious aspects, or the religious divide, the religious divide may still very much appear in those conflicts. Yeah, that's true. It's been in frequent battles since the 60s, when things went a little haywire. Let's get to that in a second. Also, Chad is slightly smaller than Peru, slightly bigger than South Africa, to give you the perspective. Well, it's 22nd largest country anyway. 
France conquered Chad by 1920 and Chad had obtained its independence in 1960. The first president then, of under whose leadership they got their independence, uh, Hansua Tombalbay, <laughs> he wasn't a nice guy as he established a one-party system shortly after gaining his power. Later, the demonstrations grew higher and a group of soldiers actually killed him. And there was the ham-fisted inclusion into the global economy and it has to this day basically kept Chad at its role as a basically a colonial extraction site, Henrik, of cheap labor, of cotton and crude oil mainly nowadays. The local politics and the global economy has not exactly supported Chad in gaining its own industrialization for its own needs, for its own people or agriculture. And therefore the Chadians live in a constant uncertainty and poverty and hunger. 200 distinct ethnic groups exist in the country, has been inhabited by agricultural and sedentary peoples. It's kind of a crossroads of civilizations there, almost in the middle of Africa. And I'm not sure if it's a result of that, but there's actually 25% of population is, uh, is white people. Name Chad comes from Lake Chad. And there are these tensions that you mentioned. For example, Sudan and Chad hate each other. There's trouble at the borders, which is frequent. Also due to Libya's attack on Chad during the civil war as a way to take you know, advantage of the moment. The Libyans are not very highly thought of either. Moreover, in recent times, Donald Trump's executive order disallows travel for nationals from eight countries into the US. This includes Chadians, which caused an uproar. Security situation for the travel-minded. At the moment, Chad appears to be mostly safe or kind of like stagnantly safe. There's violent eruptions between the government and the rebel forces every now and then. It might erupt today or tomorrow at any moment and it has happened so since around the 60s since the first president and the latest such eruption happened in 2008 three years after the president via referendum removed the constitutional term limits yeah also there's car bandits on the roads at night it's very regular if you want to leave the capital you will need a written permission from the government so better just to stay in the capital there's also police corruption even in the big cities. But still, I guess to an extent like Morocco, Chad is quite a secular country, Henrik, so keep on bringing that booze to your friends in, in the capital. It's possible to consume alcohol, but outside of the big cities it's probably not a good idea. Also, you may not want to plan your LGBT honeymoon for Chad anytime soon, because both male and female homosexuality is illegal. So if you're homosexual, you are an illegal person. You may get heavily fined or imprisoned, so... That's pretty much Chad, in a nutshell. Quite the mounting pot in the end. Yeah, frequent flights from France, if somebody's interested in of trying a little adventure time. Had around $55 for the visas, for one month. Cheap as bother. Extremely. Extremely. And if you are not familiar with this bargaining culture, and if you're not dark-skinned, then probably you will be losing your money faster than in Helsinki. All right, but uh, the idea of a screaming man, it started because the director himself had gone through civil war. And the idea started for screaming man during the shoot of Darat, which was his previous film, when the rebels invaded the capital in Jamena and the whole team learned about the invasion on the radio, but didn't know what to do. They were contemplating, should they leave or should they stay? And they experienced the being scared, being paralyzed, basically, not knowing what to do in this situation. Basically being an outsider to the war, but still being massively affected by the war. That's what this film is about. And to a large extent, it really does show in this film. Yeah. The director himself said that it's a Screaming Man is not a film about war, but about those affected by the war. These people feel they have no grip on their own lives. And if I would go with the synopsis, it could be said that it's about a family father 
uh, through whom we experience what the war is like from basically an outsider's perspective and how it still deeply affects civilians who are not directly involved in said conflicts. Yeah, it, it tries to show what a civil war means on a personal level, which when you put it back to back with the pretty village, pretty flame makes kind of an interesting, complete, uh, or creates more complete picture, because in Pretty Village you can kind of see what civil war can mean as a war, you know, when, when you are fighting it. And a screaming man kind of showcases what it means to those who have to live amongst the civil war hostilities. Absolutely. And this reminds me that at some point it would be fun to watch also this Bosnian flick called No Man's Land from 2001, which is kind of pretty village, pretty flame, but from the Bosnian side of perspective. And both of these are actually quite, I would say, respectful for the history and they don't take like a huge stance uh, against or for anything. It's, it's just about what, how the people suffer in the war. I guess we kind of do owe that much to the conflict and to the yeah. attempt of trying to understand the conflict and civil wars in general. Yeah, would be a nice balancing act since we did the Serbia episode. But um, I think it's good to move to the actors. So, Josef Jauro, who is acting as Adam or Champion, as we know him many times throughout the film. He's quite a seasoned actor. The first listed credit we can find for him is from 2001. More than likely the most famous actor in Chad. And he also acted in Darat, the previous film of the director. And then we have Diok Koma playing Abdul, an extremely experienced actor as well. And born in Mali, he's found some success in a lot of French productions. Guy seems to be kind of a workaholic, really. And then there is uh, Geneva Kone. Interestingly, she appears in this film completely with her real name. It could be that this was some kind of a tool to get into the zone with the role and she pulls it off yeah she has a lot of emotional scenes and crying and she pulls it off fantastically uh, looks like she hasn't acted since 2010 so let's go through the characters we have abdel usmane a son of adam champion 55 years old then we have mariam or mariam mom of abdel we have david the old cook who will be fired during the story. Then there is uh, Ahmad, uh, the so-called chief, disappointed because Adam hasn't paid for the war effort, his part. And then there is Masra, the new cook. The relationship with him doesn't go as well with Adam. Then Mrs. Wang is the manager at the pool. Then there is the aforementioned Geneva Kone, girlfriend of Apple. And last but not least there is Caridole, Caridole, the dog. Henrik, who the hell is Muhammad Saleh Haron? Well, that actually is quite a good question. Who the hell he really is? He is, for the most part, as I've understood, he is extremely talented and a rewarded filmmaker who still remains quite unheard of outside of France. Yeah, that's probably logical. He has lived in France since 1982, but he has had these African ventures in filmmaking as well. And despite this film kind of having quite an African white cast from what I gathered, Haron was actually born in Chad. So he's a Chadian, born in the city of uh, Abeche. He has this quote that uh, he said, things always happen for a reason. I found that the kind of a amazing quote from somebody who went through the civil war but so he thinks and the first Chadian director to enter as well as win an award in the main Cannes competition was a member of the jury in the main competition for Cannes Film Festival 2011 and for Cine Fondation and short film sections in 2014 and nominated for Palme d'Or in 2013 for his other film Grigris so there's been a lot of push to get him to the international stage. Seems like the art film fans, the juries, really like him. 
Yeah, he appears to be extremely acclaimed director, and I'm not completely sure about this. I mean, I do have a recollection that I would have seen Darat at some point. Whoa. But but I'm not completely sure about it. Okay, have you been a big consumer of the film festivals and seeing all of these that ha- got some accolades? Unfortunately, no. That is one of the great fallings of me as a film consumer and as, as a film buff. I usually tend to skip a lot of the film festivals and the showing tables that they have and the, you know, the movie lists that which play in each of the festivals. If I catch on or acclaimed film festival film, it usually is by accident two or three years after the festival has been held. Uh, cinematographer Laurent Brunet, she is a highly experienced and busy cinematographer. She has worked on Tel Aviv on Fire and uh, Seraphine, for example. Would it be the scene by scene? By all means, so let's do it. A screaming man starts with a shot of the son and the father in the pool playing games. And the pool will be kind of a central piece of the story. In a way, how important it is for the father. And the thing apparently is that the father is a old athlete, swimmer. And now on his old days, he's taking care of this affluent area with the pool. But somehow then loses it to his son later on, because the management thinks so. Still not sure if it's pushed on by, as an idea by his son. Well, the film seems to hint at that direction. Yep. At least partly by going by some of the son's behavior later on in the film. But the film never actually showcases you how the decision is exactly made. And the film does show that the management Carver does have quite a lot of reasons to demote the father. Even without the son's help in the matter. Like the main issue that the management appears to have with the ex-champ is the fact that well the champ sits around a lot instead of you know trying to lead spinning classes or something like that unlike the sun is shown to be done yeah that's probably it and probably quite logical then from the company managing the pool but uh, then the father is kind of downgraded into the gatekeeper position and very early on now around the five minute mark in the film uh, there is the watermelon cutting scene. Did you watch the documentary? Did you have time? I did check it out, and I too, oh, I was kind of surprised yeah. by the tones and the underlying message in that scene, which went completely past me when I was looking at it. And at the same time, like the watermelon scene, to those who have not yet seen the film or have just watched it, it is the director. Kind of touching the taboo subject of sex. Like, the watermelon scene symbolizes sexual act. And apparently to Chadian audiences, this was extremely obvious. They all caught up on it, and many felt shamed of seeing the scene. And felt uncomfortable with the scene in question. But, yeah, yeah, on my end, it went completely past me. Yeah, like, uh supposed to be a transgressive scene, kind of violates the accepted boundaries as a taboo subject touching on sex and definitely I did notice the scene that they were cutting watermelon I think only because I like watermelons but didn't think anything else of it but he wanted to kind of get across that uncomfortable feeling of of thinking of your parents as being intimate sexual beings and, you know, w- watching the film again, watching the scene again with the hindsight of what the director was implying, you, partly you can, you can, you know, see that in the close-ups of, you know, the watermelon slices, the close-ups of, of the champ, you know, feeding the watermelon to his wife and vice versa, and, you know, the watermelon juices being shown extremely close on their faces. Like, once you know what the director was going for, you you kind of can see some of the imagery being used, and you can kind of understand that, yeah, that, that could symbolize sex, yeah. 
But that, 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 for me, that was only with the hindsight. Then the father goes through a couple of checkpoints with his paper, and he gets to the office of Mrs. Wang. Those were kind of the downsizing negotiations. Right, and then... In which he kind of have to make the case for the management why he should be still allowed to keep his job. And there we see that his longtime colleague is now kicked out and starts drinking immediately. As you do in that situation. Yep. But overall, I was quite surprised how... I, I don't know if this is the right word, but easy. Everybody else except the champ seemed to take, you know, the knowledge of being let go from the hotel. Like, sure, you are being shown anger and frustration and at some point even hostility towards, you know, someone who is going to take your job. Like, the ex-gatekeeper does show hostility towards the champ as he has learned that the champ is going to replace him at the gate. But nobody really tries to steal anything from the hotel, nobody tries to destroy the hotel's property, or actively try to, you know, get revenge against the establishment. Not even the main character, the champ himself, who is kind of the most aggressive on the subject matter, who makes most actions to get back at something, you know, after losing his job. But also he takes his anger and his actions to his son and not to the hotel, not to the establishment. Yeah, it's kind of weird and there is this moment by the pool at 14 minutes when father and son are having this talk and and here the situation as I see it is that the father is just extremely sad and frustrated that his colleague was kicked out because in this situation he the father still doesn't know that he's been let off from his post, I understand. Uh, no, he does understand that he is in danger of losing the post. As Mrs. Yeah. Wang ma makes the notion that, do you really think that we need two poolside guardians right. at the yep. resort? But yeah, the, yeah, the new the decision hasn't been done yet. No, and I think at this moment the father is still not uh, putting any blame or doesn't have any doubts about his son. So he's very confused when his son just leaves and kind of then keeps his distance to his father for a long time after this. Uh, that was my take also. Like the first part where I would kind of get the image that the film is hinting towards the possibility that the son might have said something that would help him to keep the poolside job and demote his father is on the next scene. Yeah. The nighttime scene when they are putting, you know, the the barrier around the pool, and the father is trying to have a conversation with his son, but mm -hmm. the son kind of takes more and more distance to his father. Yeah, kind of a well-told way of, like, keeping your distance. But still at this moment for the audience, it's kind of kind of unknown what, what is going on here. My thought was that the son is suspecting that his father had done something wrong, and we just, we just don't know about it yet, but... We will get to the realization that uh, posts have been switched. And next scene is in the cafeteria or eatery restaurant. Here we have the character Ahmad, the chief. He is very disappointed that the father or Adam or Champion hasn't yet paid his contribution to the war effort against the rebels. As mentioned, I kind of like the fact that this film is not taking a huge look at the conflict itself, it's, it's just using it to tell a story about the sacrifices and casualties of war. So we can kind of keep our full attention to that, and it, it doesn't make any arguments for or against rebels or, or the government. It's just from the like regular Joe's perspective. Yeah, on my first watch of the film, I was kind of a mixed on, on the film's approach to civil war. I, I kind of felt that I would have liked to see more about the civil war, but at the same time, you know, after putting uh, having some distance from the first time seeing the film and thinking it over a couple of times, 
I do see the merit in how the director approaches the subject matter. And I showing the war more, kind of making and touching on the civil war as a war, it would kind of undermine the more personal story that the film now is telling here. And at this point, I would almost say that, you know, covering the war more would have been a missed opportunity for this film. <laughs> yeah, if you look at the ending quote, you could actually see it in many ways if you wish. Could it be like pro-war statement? Could it be a pro-flea statement? We will get to that, but there is this quote from the book that gave the inspiration for the title and the basic idea of, of this film. We naturally know what is the, like, the idea behind this film, but you can read all, all kinds of things if you want. Anyway, the chief tells that Adam has three days to pay up and support the cause. To regain his post as the pool attendant, Adam then volunteers Abdel for the army apparently. Or that's, that's what you get if you read the interwebs. The way that I read it, actually, when I watched it, is that, okay, the father is unable to pay up, and therefore the army is going to take his son as a payment. And the father doesn't react because he kind of agrees with the decision, or, well, he's unable to do anything anyway. No, the father does recruit his son to the military. Or th That was my extremely strong take on what happens in the film. But yeah. the reasons why he does it is kind of a mix. At the same time, he is hurting emotionally from losing the poolside job, which was kind of a pride to him, as he says that 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 job is all he has. That is his whole life. So basically, losing the job and becoming the gatekeeper is an, a shameful thing for him, and he feels betrayed by his son, who has the job, so there, there is the emotional motivation to do it, to have revenge and, you know, have the, have the job back. But at the same time, he's also, he's being pushed because he's lacking on the payments for the war effort. So he has to do something, you know, to make up the, the fact that he hasn't been able to pay. Yeah, qu quite radical, but uh, throughout this film we see exactly how important this job is for him and it kind of suggests uh, through Abdel as well that that uh, people from Chad or these particular people anyway give a strong value for any work and I could totally buy that under the situations that there seems to be so it's kind of a life and death situation and pride as we see later father tries to get to the pool even during a curfew or was it like that He's trying to I, get somewhere during a curfew. Yeah, I, I took it that he was trying to get home, and he I, I guess he was leaving the pool and trying to return home. Okay. And then uh, hard to say, detour. because it was middle of the night, and you yeah. weren't actually sure where the father was coming from at that point. So most probably not going to the pool, unless he was, it was extremely early morning, but uh, there's also this point made about the father that he looks at his body in front of a mirror and feels that maybe he is not quite what he used to be and not adequate enough to be at the poolside anymore which is kind of a, like a personal hit for him yeah there, there is the aspect that since since he is a past swimming champion and no, now has to face the old age and the fact that he is no longer in his prime Everybody still calls him champ, and he apparently very much likes to be called a champ to remind him of the glory days, of the days when he was actually a high-class athlete. And yeah. at the same time, you know, the, the present state makes it extremely clear in every way, both his job and his social status, uh, but also, you know, his physicality that, you know, those days are gone. You are no longer fit athlete in no way. Now, now you are a grey-haired old man who is slowly putting on some weight. These scenes with the father and son in the corridors of this work building and at home during dinner are very uncomfortable and kind of makes me think why would his son even go through all the trouble of kind of disappointing 
his father and living with the shame of basically kicking out his father, if that's what he actually did, of his post. And why would that necessarily even be a problem? It could even be a um, benefit. What, what was the son doing there previously? I think he was just partying with the girls. Yeah. So now the son has a post as the pool attendant and the father takes care of the gate. Okay, and they live under the same household. So cannot they just collect the money from their own respective roles and have fun with it? Um, yeah, the film makes that kind of a hard to say how the film eventually showcases the son's side on the matter. Because what what you find out later on in the film is that the son has a girlfriend whom he has actually managed to knock up and get pregnant. Meaning that he's now becoming a father, most likely would have to, you know, move on to his own, leave his parents' house. Mm, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so so there there is the financial need. Yeah, there's actually a real need for him to get some more money. That's yeah. that, that cannot be argued against. And to his dad, the poolside job is basically all he has in life. Of course, I I don't know how much the gatekeeping job pays. So, why the son couldn't have asked to be transported to the gate, yeah. for example? And why couldn't the... is there a reason why the family couldn't help the, the new family of the son? There's... I guess there's a lot of, you know, <laughs> cultural dynamics that are kind of lost on us because we don't have Abdul Baba as a guest anymore. At least, you know, th- there are a lot of issues in the, in the background, and a lot of knowledge which might help the characters act differently throughout the movie and make different decisions. But the problem arises that none of the characters actually tells other characters anything until to a point where it's already too late. The son could have brought up the fact that he has a girlfriend and a baby on the way at basically any point of the story, but he stays silent, the dad does not tell his son about how he feels about the situation. Nobody tells the mother of the family anything about anything. All the characters keep each other in the dark. And that kind of a really makes it impossible for anyone to try to make a joint decision on any point of the story. It's kind of weird that they are not even able to open their mouth to say something good about the food. There's, it's just complete disconnect right here. Yeah, I, I get the silent treatment aspect that the father is giving to the son, but at, at that point, you know, you are you are already hurting the entire family unit. Mm. After this scene, once again we see the father doing now... Um, sit-ups. Feeling bad about his current health or physical appearance, after which once again he has to hop onto the car of the chief and have a little chat about the money. And this is the point in the film where the chief brings up the possibility of having the son enlisted into the army. Then the father goes through the poolside and sees his son and he doesn't even look at his father. Passes by the pool and sits basically with tears in his eyes at his new post. Visits his friend from work who is having heart problems. And at the 40 mark, the son is having a chat again. Well, very one-sided discussion there with his father who is completely not reacting to anything that he says. After which the son is dragged by the military to military to army. Because that is how you actually deal with job competition inside the family. <laughs> yeah, for me, this whole family dynamic seemed kind of quite cold after this one situation. Because, as we all know, like Muslims kind of have the reputation of being very loving and uh, like a very tight in their family and friend circles. But here, we seem to learn what it means to be having some post at work and having some pride about it. Also, we see a lot of white people now at the pool. Not sure if there are locals. Could very well be, as mentioned. 20% should be white around there. 
So the film was filmed in the Jadian capital in Jamena and also in the birth city of the director Mohammed Saleh Haron in Abishe. I learned that in Abishe this situation was was kind of more volatile for filming and they were just hoping that they get their shooting done in time before anything goes haywire and they did. The director kind of tried to use the volatile situation also to his advantage to get the best out of his performances from the actors because that's that's how you do with uh, inexperienced actors. Now finally the girlfriend of Abdel is arriving to the city. She's basically now taken into the care of uh, Abdel's family and tells the entire story of hers and that she is pregnant. And they have to disappoint her to say that, well, Abdel has gone to the army. And after which the father little by little starts to reconsider his position of putting his son to the army. And of course everything goes to shit. Well, it was a good idea at the time. Pretty brutal. But of course the father is also influenced by the things that are fed to him. For for example from the chief who said that at the 17 years of age he put his 17 year old son to the army to serve his country. Was it like he kind of died there? I'm not sure but he was put into the army. I, I guess it was never told what happened to the son. Yeah. He just but, gave he gave his son to the army or something like that. Is yeah, he, he he just gave gave his son to the army partly because he figured that a captain in a family, like if his son would become a captain, that would be a boost for the entire family because then the family could say that we have a our family has a captain in it. Yeah, there would be that upping in the social hierarchy. Followed by this nightly scene at fifty seven minutes in. Where the father is kind of, yeah, he's sobbing and then kind of giving his face a little wash. Followed by at 57 as well. This one soldier giving the C tape, cassette tape for the girlfriend. And here I will say that this is the most powerful moment of this film. When she puts the cassette tape to the player, listens to it, and hears how everything is going terribly. He's kind of being very honest about the situation. He wants to get out of there and all of his friends are getting killed and he is scared. He just gives it straight and he doesn't see that there would be a future for their child there. So he plans to get out of, I think, Chad completely with the family. Yeah, at this point the son is thinking about deserting the army and escaping Chad. Yeah. With his girlfriend. Which I can take that means that the situation really has to be on a downer note. Because deserting the army or during a civil war is something that I would believe would extremely fast get you killed. Yep. And she cries listening to it. And I would say that she is really convincing. I, I like the scene. She starts singing. And the song, she sings it and... There is a moment in the documentary as well, when you see her uh, singing it and the father comes into the scene and it was also earlier stated that uh, she is a singer from Mali. And uh, during the filming there was a comment from the director that the moment he said cut, after the first take the whole crew looked away to dry their eyes. And the song is called uh, The Child Who Has No Parents. So you get the idea. She has kind of already started to accept that this can end tragically. As one kind of a has to in these kind of situations. Yeah. Then there is the scene where the father is during the curfew, which we just heard from the radio in the previous scene during daytime, that there's a curfew from, was it uh, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. or something. And he stopped on the road and asked to turn back. And he does. Kind of for a moment it seems that he's going to get a little bit of a beating up <laughs> from them, but uh, he's let go. Yeah, it, it very much hints the direction that he is about to be end up injured during the roundup, which he faces 
But uh, w once again, you know, him being some kind of a celebrity or at least well-known figure in the village thanks to his past swimming championship, he is well-known enough that soldiers in the end just let him go. That could be it. That could be it. Then there is talk about that everybody is leaving for Cameroon, the neighboring country. Everyone's fleeing. And the mom says that it's chaos out there. Also, their neighbor is leaving with her family. But he doesn't want to go anywhere. And there are kind of a couple of moments in this film where it is not clear when we start to watch the scene that what is actually going on. For example, now the dad goes to <laughs> strangle the chief when he finds him when everybody is fleeing at 108. But... Um, we then, then find out that the father already knows that something terrible has happened to his son. Did he know it at that point already? Well, in the previous scene, it's only about the... It's the nighttime scene where the mother is talking about whether we should go Cameroon like everybody else. But uh, then we have the day scene where they fight. So it's not explained to the audience, as far as I see. No, to, to me, I... I read the attack against the village chief simply as an anger of seeing the chief who has been the authorial figure in the village to this point, kind of a trying to escape the situation like all the other rats. Could be, but the next scene is then when the girlfriend is crying. And there's a lot of problems with the subtitles because sometimes the subtitle rows just don't appear. They are somehow probably timed incorrectly, which causes the subtitles to disappear. So, at the scene where she's crying, we don't even know if Abdel has actually died, or is he just injured, or how much is he injured, what is going on. I thought that actually at this point they had received the information that he is dead, but unfortunately I don't speak French. Yeah, so. I, I did manage to fiddle with the subtitles a bit, and... Carnival kind of did get them in sync more, and my take was that at this point nobody yet knows what has happened to Abdel, but the, the scene is all about the father finally kind of uh, losing his silence to the guilt that he feels for enlisting his son, and at this point he just confesses to the son's girlfriend that he is the one who is to blame for the fact that Abdel is not there at the moment. That Abdel is in the army. Right, and interesting aspect about the father keeping his hand on the mouth of Geneva so that nobody can hear her crying. So again, probably some kind of a cultural aspect that we would have to know a little bit better, but of course this might have something to do with protecting the honor or the how you appear to the neighbors, avoiding rumors. It, it, it actually now that you mention it could be. Like to me it, it read as an action that the father is trying to prevent the girlfriend from having a situation right then and there mm. where she could tell everyone what the father has done. And that, that yeah. would be why he would be muffling out her cries, so that no, no one would hear her crying and would get interested in what's the matter, and at that point, you know, the girlfriend would break the news. I guess you could go with that, but I believe she already knew that uh, he was in the army. Of course, he, she did, because she listened to the audio tape, but it could kind of all collide, all those emotions at that point, and she might go tell the entire city what is going on then again at, at, at the same time you kind of can't believe that the girlfriend will be staying quiet about the facts that much longer like the dad is now muffling her cries but they right the next minute once he leaves her the girl i i'm very certain that the girlfriend will just run up to the next person she can find and you know they're that person they're the mother of the family Exactly who sent her son to the army. Yeah, who sent her son to die. Yeah, once the dad breaks the news to the girlfriend, it's just a matter of time when the cat is finally out of the bag. Yeah, he, he is able to get into the military hospital and 
to go check on his son. And here I was kind of a, a little hopeful, Henrik, because we mostly see the head bandage and something, but it appears that his situation is way more fragile and he should have been in some kind of a extensive care unit, which they don't have apparently. And come nighttime, he's amazingly able to smuggle out his son. Yeah, apparently staying awake while on guard duty is something that is not that big of a deal in the Chadian army. Yeah, we have at least one reference point to make that assumption. <laughs> well, at, at least one reference point provided by this film. Yep, and they take a little break under the tree. Actually, the car is making some funny sounds right before they stop, so felt like their car is going to break down in the burning sun, but they get under the tree and the sun tells that he still wants to go swimming with all of those bandages apparently and whatever. The father then takes him to the river and he gets indeed to enjoy his swim completely, except in the afterlife because he dies. Just before being able to confess his dad that he does know what his father did. Like, he, he knows the truth who sent him to the army. Yeah, it's really sad, Henrik, and that's kind of the film. He drags his son to the river for a little hugsy and then pushes him to the river to be taken over by the river. And there we have the quote, which is, and I quote, once I find it, the subtitles show for me which seems to be cutting as well. Quote, Beware of assuming the sterile attitude of a spectator, for life is not a spectacle, a sea of miseries in is not a proscenium. End quote. It seemed like it was supposed to continue, but then it kind of cuts off again. <laughs> well, I, I, I do have yeah. a couple of more lines. A screaming man is not a dancing bear. Yeah. And, and in my subtitles, that is where the quote finally ends. Yeah, the film is inspired by by taking a kind of a new take or look at Césaire's book, which was translated to Notebook of a Return to the Native Land. And the full quote from the book is, quote, Beware, my body and my soul, beware above all of crossing your arms and assuming the sterile attitude of the spectator. For life is not a spectacle, a sea of griefs is not a proscenium, and a man who wails is not a dancing bear. And the d director says that uh, those lines for him are a call for engagement. To engage with life in the city through people we cross every day who could potentially transform us. And when we hear a man scream, we need to think that he is not really suffering, that's all just a show. But when you look at this quote, there's for example the part Beware of assuming the sterile attitude of a spectator. You could even take this as a call for arms, in my opinion, without having enough context of the, of the writer, but I'm sure that they were not doing that here. And it could also be taken as a escape the situation, like a call for action to get the hell out of there, or a call for action to do anything but to be sterile. So yeah. Yeah, I I also could see that it could also be a condemnation of basically anyone who watches the situation from afar. Yeah. Like e even for us who approach the situation in form of watching this movie, because once again the movie itself touches a real life conflict and a civil war conflict in general and. We, as uh, as an audience, as podcast host, we also take extremely sterile a look at the subject at hand. Because we, we are watching and analyzing a film that deals with this subject, but we do not familiarize ourselves with Civil War, nor with a Civil War in Chad. We are very much in the privileged position of an outsider's. Someone who simply witness a spectacle in hand, which is the film. Yeah, you don't every day watch a film from Chad, so in simply that perspective, it was extremely interesting to go through this film. And, you know, to get more personal with the situation from another location than the United States for a change. 
And you can get more personal with civil war in general. Yep. As a form of conflict. Because in many ways, civil wars are the most destructive destructive conflicts that exist. Not necessarily in the terms of body counts. And not necessarily in terms of forms of horror being produced in the conflict. Like, there are extremely devastating conflicts, extremely horrifying historical events that take place in wars. Like, for example, the First and Second World War and everything that happened in those, the Vietnam War. But yeah, yeah. C- civil wars carry the, the theme of the battle lines being drawn a very close to oneself. It's, it's family, it's, it's a neighbor against a neighbor. A town against town. In the worst scenarios, it's even a family member against family member. And that kind of actions leave emotional scars that can last for generations. And therefore, I I would always hazard to say that your typical war where there, there are two different countries, sometimes, you know, divided even by an ocean, and they fight each other. And there, there is the whole invasion and and being an invading force on another country and having the war there. It can, in a way, maybe even be emotionally more pure, e- emotionally not as hurtful as as a conflict where you have to fight against your neighbor or even a family member. Yeah, and the civil war can also be detrimental for believing in your country i think it's kind of the death of a state it's the failure of the state in the people's minds when you have these rebel groups fighting against each other and the state and the state fighting them and then you just being their regular joe they're going every day about your work and business and family and getting food to your table at some point in certain situations it it might come to the point that, that there is no state It's just broken factions, everybody looking for their own territory, and looks like uh, there is still uh, still a lot of love for Chad, in Chad. Yeah, that's a good notion you make, civil war as a failure of a state. Because what you said is is true, and also the causes that lead into a civil war often are somehow the failures of a state. The rebel groups, or whoever is is the starting party in the civil war. He has some kind of a motive that more often than not emerges from a perceived failure within a state. A wrong leader, a social group who has been mistreated way too long by the state, or, or you know, you know, some reason like that, which usually sparks the hostilities in some way. And that also kind of a... it, it kind of a tears down... The, the image that you can have about your state, because the enemy no longer is someone outsider who you can demonize. It's no longer the squinty-eyed chaps, yeah. or the, you know, the turban-wearing sad or anything like that, which you can say in order to demonize the other and say that, you know, they are at fault. They are the wrong party. At that point, everybody looks at someone who is produce of the same state. And everybody can see that the the root of the conflict somehow lies within the state not being able to fully perform. It might be really telling about the spirit of Chadians for Chad that during the civil war in Chad in the 70s that when Libya tried to use this fragile situation to their advantage, they actually the Chadians kind of joined forces in a way to push off Libyans the hell out of their country, which actually worked. So there is there is still people who hold Chad dear to their hearts, let's say. I, I guess basically in, in civil war situation, everyone taking part in the conflict somehow at some level holds the nation in question close to their hearts. Yeah. And once again, I'm I'm not expert on civil wars. When we had our own in Finland, I failed to take part in it. But uh, civil wars, to me, in many ways, they they are a conflict about the present state of the well, o- the state yeah. and the direction everybody feels that the state should be, 
or the road that they everybody feels that the state should take. That is the, the driving ideal behind the starting and the going on of a civil war conflict. Because no, nobody is actually saying that the state should cease to exist. The state is not something that should be eradicated from the face of the earth like it can be, you know, in, in your typical wartime situation. Yeah. You can say that Viet- Vietnam should be burned to the ground and be, you know, completely eradicated from the world, but but in civil war situation, everybody agrees that the state should still continue existing. It just should either exist like it has existed before, or then it should exist in some some way differently than previously. Henrik, have you ever felt like you are the screaming man? Like, we are not religious here, but did you ever feel like you'd been in a situation where it could be said, quote-unquote, that God had abandoned you? I actually feel that feeling quite often, <laughs> especially on the modern days, which I kind of have the inkling feeling that we are getting more and more chaotic and more and more aggressive day by day. And it, I'm I'm actually, at the, at this point, I'm honest to God, I'm dreading that, well, not in Finland, but but worldwide, we might be nearing to, uh, towards uh, some kind of a conflict with each other, which will get pretty bad at the end. Because we exist in this weird moment where there are countless of ideologies and ideas that are opposing each other. And the dialogue between these ideas, it's getting more harsher every moment. We we have the rising right-wing attitudes, we have the liberals who take ever the more aggressive tone. And I, I don't know, I, I don't see that this is a societal situation that can just keep on existing and just growing up infinitely. Like at some point, somewhere, it has to reach the tipping point. Yeah, you know. Unless we find a way to once again, you know, cool our heads and take a step backwards and and tone down the ever more aggressive dialogue a bit. We're talking about the post-truth very often, but I hope this will also bring the counter-element to it, that we start to you know, look for better sources of information, think a little bit more about what we say publicly, and it doesn't look very promising on the other side of the pond right now. It was very good that you brought up the point that also the left has done a lot of wrong steps here right now and for example in the states the same disc is playing all over again it seems that th- there are not enough people who would learn from their mistakes if something didn't work before then probably you shouldn't be trying that right now once again after the elections where you failed to appease the majority of the voters or well, at, the, at least the Electoral College. But uh, more than anything, Henrik, I am worried about the next financial system catastrophe. We avoided it by a threat in 2008. We got a lot of new ways to exchange goods after that. A lot of innovation has happened. But still, majority of the world is rolling with the same system the global financial system and it has been the prediction that something could go extremely wrong very soon in the same way and this time we would not survive that hit yeah so i'm looking forward to that yeah the the american electoral system is something which i won't take part in discussing today on this episode, we, we need another <laughs> film for that discussion. Yeah, no need. Too many doors opened again by me. Yeah, but w- what you said about the next financial catastrophe, that actually could be something that finally pushes us over the edge pretty permanently. Because l- like you said, yeah, we did manage to escape the last fiasco by the skin of our teeth. But even in there, the pain... And the turmoil that was caused, it very much still kind of exists in the attitudes underneath the most exterior layers of the society. 
Like, you can give you the example, just look at, for example, Rainbow Six, the cancelled Rainbow Six game, The Patriots, of which Bloodline very much was dealing with, you know, the anger and frustration towards the last financial crisis and the players of that crisis. And even though, like you said, some steps have been taken to make sure that that does not happen again, there there is some trade agreements that have been made in order to kind of a further make it easier to nations trade with each other and this way kind of a re-stabilize the financial situation. At the same time, we also are very much losing the ability to have communication and have a joint stand in many cases. Like, look at, for example, the Brexit and what it does to the situation in Ireland. The first signs of, you know, the re-emerging troubles kind of have once again showcased. There is the first acts of violence in Ireland. So I, I don't know if the acts that we have taken are are enough at the, this point. Especially when you also take in consideration the fact that, well, globally in terms of events like global warming and such like, we kind of are also, as a planet, nearing to a tipping point. So we just face more crises every single minute, and we apparently have still not completely figured out what to do with the legacy of the previous crisis. And I I, I don't know, I mean, I, I kind of fear that unless some kind of a miraculous solution for the global dialogue can be found pretty damn fast, we will enter in some form of a conflict. And I'm, I'm just kind of afraid that at that point when the conflict finally breaks out, I myself am too damn tired and too damn broken to anymore take part in it. And that kind of raises the question, what will happen to my relatives, you know, the people close to me? Can I anymore protect them? Yeah, yeah. Like, everything is a temporary privilege, as once again Carlin put it. So, we may have rights for now, but nobody knows what the future holds. So, as we cannot guarantee the future, there is no guarantee that these rights or privileges can be upheld, because the financial system is going to decide it for you, how this is going to pan out. So, always diversify your assets. It's my suggestion. Yeah, yeah, and you know, try to open up. Just just try to have patience and just try to talk once more. Because that's kind of the theme of the film also. A screaming man in a lot of ways, it, it's a film about the importance of, of communication. It's about the importance of screaming. In many ways, yeah. In in your opponent's face. Hopefully with very strong verbal abuse. Yeah. But but in the, in the film, the situation that eventually erupts, it could have been, or in my opinion, it could have been avoided so many goddamn times in different ways, or it at least, you know, the worst case scenario, the characters could have tried to look for alternative solutions and make joint plans throughout the film would they just have once again taken the, the, the time to see the trouble of talking to each other? Exactly. Let's go through fast the awards. So the film received the Cannes Film Festival Jury Prize. And uh, Haron not only became the first Chadian director to have a film in the main competition, but also the first to receive the festival's award. One also, this film won the Silver Hugo for Best Screenplay at the Chicago International Film Festival. And Yusuf Jaoro, the actor of Adam, got the Silver Hugo for Best Actor. And many, 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 many more prizes. To mention the DVD quickly, it exists. Yes, we bought it from Alipris. Quite noticeable subtitle issues. Four or five lines at least are without subtitles. It's a bit distracting at least in my version, and the encoding of the image is a bit pixely, I have to say, but the disc appears to be a single layer disc, as the disc holds data, or the disc data is only 4 gigabytes, 
So this would explain the video artifacts. Probably not noticeable at all when you use like a old TV, but who does nowadays? Yeah, we are all about HD screens today. Yeah, there is also the digital release on Amazon. You can watch it on Amazon Prime. And no, we do not have an affiliate link to the Amazon <laughs> version. No, we do not. No, because we are terrible in monetizing this podcast. We truly are. God. <laughs> alternate versions. Where there is an alternate version of A Screaming Man. Is there? It's called the A Screaming Man Director's Cut. There's a five minute scene shot from one camera angle, just following an ass that is controlled by Adam. And the ass is carrying Abdel back home and he survives the trip. Unhappy ending. You are joking, right? Yeah, I'm joking. <laughs> Completely. Say, fool me once. Shame <laughs> on me. <laughs> yeah. God damn. I'm, I do apologize for being a total asshole in this episode for you. No, no need. No need. <laughs> I do give huge props <laughs> for the stunt and how you managed to play it out. <laughs> All right, if you want to have further reading on the background of the film, you can read the Return to My Native Land by I'm Cesar. Quick categories. Favorite performance. Go ahead. I guess we... Well, I'm not sure if we are going to pe- pick the same one, but I will go with Yusuf Diauro, who plays the main character. Okay, apparently we are going with different ones, because I decided that uh, Gene Bacone as Gene Bacone was. Having a really I, great performance, uh, ability yeah, of crying. I, I, I was kind of uh, expecting that that would be your pick. Seeing how you already, you know, named your favorite scene in the film. Which is the crying and singing scene. What about you? I, I guess, you know, to be not nearly as tactful and and not, not nearly as, as serious as you have been, I guess I will go with the Metal Gear Dad scene at the very end of the film. <laughs> Metal Gear Dad. <laughs> Favorite quote? Well, uh, and, and this is so- something that is very hard to place on the film, but a fickle thing, the heart. I would be absolutely illogical and just pick the moment when we have the dog and the previous cook who was nice for the dog and he's calling the dog, Got it all, got it all. It's my favorite quote. <laughs> that that I I must give you that is illogical. <laughs> like like you you lose like five Spock points for that big. <laughs> you know, gotta be nonsensical at least sometimes in this podcast. Favorite kill. Uh, well, this category is starting to get really disturbing in this podcast. The, wouldn't you say? I I well we have. Recently we have picked a lot of films where, you know, many of our quick categories just don't plain up work. Yep. And th- this is, one, once again, one more example, because there is only one death in the entire film, and that would be the son dying from the unknown wounds at the very end. And the question is, are you, will you, do you want to be big enough to choose this one, or just skip it? I most definitely will. Choose or skip? Choose. You see, you see, someone has to be a professional in this goddamn podcast and be able to make the picks. <laughs> What's there to pick? Well, I choose Abdel. Are you happy? Yeah, it's it's a very good pick, you know. How how did you get, you know how how did you came into that choose? Well, you know, I put one and one together. <laughs> well, you know, at this point that the podcast we like to confuse each other a little bit so once in chat camel meat is a prevalent form of fine dining henrik would you eat camel if it's legally allowed i i i guess i could give it a try even though i i'm fairly certain that that is the answer that will once again get us kicked off from youtube or at least this episode blocked and I'll, I'll also uh, us both on the watch list of basically Every animal rights group there is. Well, of course I'm referring to Vamel, Henrik. It's the vegan camel meat. Well, in that case, yeah, I would have no problem at all. First image that comes to mind. It, apparently it would be this dad seeing 
up their spotty off down the river at the very end of the film. Yeah, that would also be my pick. It's the first thing that pops. Which image best exemplifies this beast? I guess it would be the same goddamn scene. Pretty much, because that, that, that is kind of the culmination point of the themes of the film. It kind of is. It's kind of a religious moment. In the beginning you don't really have such of an establishing moment. I no, it, it, but the movie for the most part, it's building up to that final moment. Yeah. It shows you the underlying themes and you, you get a lot of, lot of moments which showcase you the situation and what the situation means to a, each of the characters. But the, the basic point that the movie tries to make is the extremely destructive nature of civil war and how much it hurts and how much you lose on a personal level even if you are not yourself a fighter in the said war. And that all kind of comes into fruition in the very last moment when the dad loses his son. What took you out of a screaming man? In my first viewing, I'm ashamed to say that, well, the lack of showing the civil war in itself, that, you know, hmm. as the film is very conservative when it comes to actually showing you the war itself. But I have to point out, this was only on the first viewing. Basically, once I got, you know, got more time to actually understand what I had just seen, I came to understand exactly how naive and even stupid that stance from me was. Like, this, this is a film that does most definitely does not need the Civil War material any more than it already has. So that was, you know, that was the failing on my part. Then again, it, it is my understanding that the director has voiced it out in some way that he was not able to do completely what he wanted within the limited scope of the budget and production so I am curious to know what he would have changed like what what would be the director's scissors of sacrilege at this moment but uh, what took me out have to say that I can't really pinpoint anything in particular perhaps the like last 30 minutes are stronger in a sense than the beginning but I'm satisfied nothing in particular what pulled you in the first scene with the chief, where the monetary aspect of being a civilian in a civil war situation is brought up. Yeah. Once again, I'm not sure what to specifically pick here, other than that. I very much enjoyed being thrown into this territory of Chad <coughs> to get some new vistas. As scream as they might be sometimes. Strongest act, one, two, three. Uh, go with three, because that's where everything culminates. I, uh, yeah, that, that is also my pick and also my reasoning wh why the third act is the strongest one. Yeah, that's an easy one and the most exciting moment. Well, surprisingly, it is not actually the nighttime sneaking in, in the military base, but instead it is the moment where Around the middle of the film, where the dad's desperation for being demoted from the poolside job kind of comes into its tipping point. Just before he makes the decision of actually, you know, enlisting his son. Yeah, that's a good one. I have to say that at the moment when they tried to escape the military hospital, that was quite tense and I was fully sure that this is all going to go straight to hell. And e e in its way it does. It does, and in... I'll go with that. Yeah, that scene is the most, well, action-packed. And it is the scene where the outlying threat is most kind of a visible. Like, th there is the threat that the dad who is sneaking in the military area without permission at that point will get caught and shooting will happen because of that. Yeah, the worst situation scenario that you could pull from this could have been that they could have both got and killed right then and there. I, I was kind of expecting that to happen myself too. Yeah. I, I was expecting that it would culminate on the fact that this, the dad fails to smuggle his son out and they will just get, you know, shot. Yeah, and then, you know, maybe some dramatic moment where they have the last look into each other's eyes and then just saying, 
I know, this was kind of shit, but I love you anyway, and roll credits. Yeah. To me, on my pick, you know, showcasing the dad's frustration with losing the poolside job, I, I, I very much enjoyed, once again, on the first viewing of the film, when I still didn't know what the dad is going to actually do. I did very much enjoy the, the ambiguity of the moment, mm. and the tension... When I actually understood that the dad is going to do something, like something is going to happen because the dad is not going to take the situation as it is, but I didn't yet know what is the action he is going to perform. You could open the question, what do you think is going to happen after this film? You could even have a sequel about this. But, I mean, the father survives the ordeal, so is this even worse for him than dying with his son? In, in a way, I would say, because now he does know that his son has died. He does know that the son was aware of what he had done. He has the guilt with which he has now have to live. And on top of that, basically the entire household that still is, wife and the son's girlfriend, at this point, most likely know very well what he has done. Return to home yeah. won't be the most uplifting moment in the man's life. Not exactly. Happily back to the pool. Happily back to the pool. Only cost you a son, and most yeah. likely the rest of the family too. Scissors of Sacrilege, what would you change? I wouldn't touch the film. Like, like, like I said, in, in the, during the first viewing, I was a bit troubled by the fact that the Civil War wasn't so, being shown more. But I do stress out that that was me being an ass, and me failing the movie instead of the movie failing me. So, yeah, with the new opened eyes, I wouldn't touch the film. Okay, yeah, on my part, I feel that this film has been very well balanced. I think they did a great job putting together this one. Maybe we should give a little shout out to the editor as well. Her name is... Marie Helen Dozo. <laughs> she won the Magritte Award for Best Editing for her work in Kinshasa Kids. And with that out of the way, you really know you're watching a screaming man when... You go to the pool the next time. <laughs> <laughs> you really know you're watching a screaming man when you see your son dragged to the water for the last goodbyes. Three adjectives to describe the film. I'll go with slow, melodic and tragic. I'll go with slow, baking hot in the sun and I would go heartbreaking. And probably it doesn't give any extra value to mention that we probably did not watch our watches. No, I most definitely didn't. I actually would may even point out how smoothly and how fastly the movie kind of felt that it went past you. Like, you you really didn't feel like you were spending hour and a half watching this film. It, it felt like 20 minutes. It was over sooner than you even expected it to be. I didn't, but in practice I guess I did, because unfortunately I had to do some other jobs between watching the film, which is not really a good way to watch a film, but that happened this time, and you know, it's the modern life, I guess, drawing our attentions all over the place. Would you recommend this film, Henrik? I would, very much so, and if you have watched our previous Civil War film, The Pretty Village, I think The a Screaming Man goes very nicely with that one. So, Gary, would you recommend Screaming your head off while watching a screaming man. Yeah, most definitely I would. I mean, yeah, it goes nicely, as you said, together with the themes that we have tackled before. I have kind of tried to find some kind of a balance between the themes that we have in these international films, and I suppose we are doing a pretty decent job so far. And um, Yeah, it, it has been very nicely wartime horrors, wartime horrors, and wartime horrors. <laughs> What? <laughs> we have had something else too, right? But then, but then again, what could be the better way to look into the particular country that we are dealing with than wartime horrors? 
Yeah, you you have a have a good point. Basically, the best looking glass to any country or any society is to look at the moments when that country or society has failed. Yeah, struggled and shown its best and worst points, I guess. There's no point in g- giving a fair presentation to any any country and, you know, or, or looking at a film that showcases you that country actually succeeding in something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In, in the internationality in the end is is nothing if not looking at the errors in, on the other. Yeah, I mean if it's not about the war crimes of the United States against the natives, or if it's not about the Moroccan terrorist attacks, or if it's not about <laughs> the homosexuals in a Catholic church in Poland, or civil war in Chad, you know, what would this podcast be? Well, it would be at least ten times easier. <laughs> I can give you that much. <laughs> Come on, was was Dumbo easy? I have to say, okay, well, okay. It, actually, it, it, it was. was. It, it was. Actually, it was. God damn. Uh, all you had to tackle was the animal cruelty, <laughs> and also the capitalistic machine as a whole. But yeah, and racism. And but, racism. <laughs> but considering all the other themes, it was pretty okay, pretty easy times. Hendrik, I don't know about you, but I think we can be found on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Not, not in Google Plus anymore. Unfortunately, Google has destroyed Google Plus, so no more pluses. Well, yeah, well, unfortunately, and un- unfortunately, because we actually managed to get our content blocked on Google Plus, so good riddance for that. Oh yeah, that was the porn episode. They didn't like it. <laughs> Hashtag porn <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> Automatic ban. <laughs> Goddamn puritans. And as mentioned, we still have the International Cinema Challenge going throughout the goddamn year. And this was one film of that, A Screaming Man. Hopefully you will join us for the next International Cinema episode. But next week, Henrik, I think our next film is The Man Who Haunted Himself. Starring none other than the brother from another mother, Roger Moore. Does that mean that he looks less or more confused than in his average Bond film? Yeah, more than usual, in fact. He has lost his me- memory. So. Oh, my fucking guy. Please be confused more. He has lost well, his me- memory. So. M- most definitely looking forward to that one. Give the guy a break. He, he has lost his memory. Well, the guy is actually giving us a break here because I haven't seen the film myself yet. But I do believe that it is going to be a smoother sale than our international film challenge episodes. I would believe so. And very often has been said that this is kind of the high point of Roger Moore's acting career. That he is really pulling all the punches as an actor in this one. And, you know, really? They are not giving that credit to some of his Bond films. Because the dude <laughs> made like, what, 50,000 Bond films. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that I was a little disappointed that there wasn't, at moments, given enough death for the James Bond character of Roger Moore in those films. There were attempts, but then Moore wasn't always kind of forthcoming to go into that direction, and he felt that the kind of the more uplifting, humorous way would go much more nicely with his character and personality, in which which it did, I guess. But you could have found a balancing act. For example, in The Spy Who Loved Me, you have this amazing scene where where the girl confronts Roger Moore's James Bond and asks point blank, did you kill my boyfriend? And he says that, oh, as a matter of fact, I did. It was a nice little expedition in the mountains and uh, we were skiing and <laughs> I got a bullet in his back. And uh, But you know, and yeah, this happens on the job, so... You know it, and I know it. And... But that will be for the Bond episode, for some future episode. Most definitely looking forward at that. <laughs> yep, that's all for this week. Take care, and uh, thank you, Henrik. I'm happy that I got to ruin your flights. And uh, all apologies to, to your girlfriend. Don't worry about that. <laughs> worry about the next week, which is, you know, the students picking up the speed. It's going to be one hell of a week. See you next week. See you next week.
It's a landlocked Af- Af- African country. Uh, Libya, Sudan, Central African Republican, Central African Republic.